the next you know, th uh, thing that's really exciting, I think, in, in uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma right now, and certainly is a topic of a lot of focus at this meeting, uh, is cellular immunotherapy, that is autologous cellular immunotherapy, including CAR T-cell therapies. Uh, and we have some very, I think, interesting data that are being presented at this meeting. Um, you know, we have the Abramson's a Abramson ab abstract, and I know, Leo, you're part of that study. Uh, looking at relapsed refractory DLBCL, and I thought that you know, perhaps you could you could share with us your your sure. Th this is a, a study looking at JCAR17, uh, which is the latest iteration of the Juno CAR CAR T, uh, it's, um, and it's uh, we've treated so far. Uh, there have been uh, 39 patients, uh, 28 have been fereased, and we're reporting on on 14 treated so far. Um, Ten of those patients have had prior uh, transplants, so they're a fairly heavily pretreated group of patients. The overall response rate, and we do um, PET scans on day 30 and then at day 90, is about 80 uh, percent, with about 70 some odd percent complete remissions. Now, the problem with that uh, is that the follow-up so far has been pretty short. One of the major concerns about CAR T, and we're not sure. I don't think anybody is sure yet about what the reason for this is is the cytokine release, the cytokine storm that occurs, and the neurologic toxicity that occurs. And certainly in the ALL patients, for some reason, that's been a much higher, uh, higher risk. We haven't seen that very much. It's less than 20% uh, so far cytokine storm, and there's been no cases of neurologic toxicity, at least so far, uh, in, this, uh, in this trial. Uh, we are using uh, cytoxin fludarabine as lymphodepleting. Uh, chemotherapy just before the cells are, are infused. Um, our experience, my experience, has been that people have tolerated that fairly well. They do get actually neutropenic prior to coming in for the, for the CAR-T, um, but, uh, and we're watching them fairly closely in the hospital. Uh, many places, I know Cam Turtle and the group in Seattle have been doing it long enough that they're doing most of these as, as outpatients, actually. Um, and I think Steve Schuster at Penn also has done most of these as, as outpatients in their, in their iteration of CAR-T therapy. So um, I think the concept is a very interesting one. It's, it, to me, it's similar to allogeneic transplant, but without the risk, the risk of graft-versus-host disease. I think what's interesting, uh, to me anyway, is that um, if you look at uh, trying to collect the cells and trying to maintain them, uh, the idea of perhaps using checkpoint inhibitors to increase the number of central memory T cells that you want to collect for this and then to maintain them afterwards uh, might be uh, something that will be added to some of these protocols that may increase the uh, efficacy uh, of this approach. No, and I think a, c a few things that are worth pointing out about the JCAR-017 uh, program is that, that there are measured uh, you know, equal proportions of CD4 and CD8 T cells, which is a little different than the JCAR-015 uh, program. The JCAR-015 program, which has, has been, uh, you know, recently, uh, you know, the subject of a lot of attention at ALL because there have been clinical holds related to cerebral edema and neurotoxicity. Right. Um, you know, we don't know if that's because of the composition of the product. We also know, though, I think that BALL does appear to be a different disease. Ironically, even though we don't know that there was CD19 expression uh, in the brain, uh, that it, it may have something to do with the biology of BALL that the rate of neurotoxicity is higher. And certainly, I think it's, it's true, seems to be true across programs, uh, you know, both, uh, I think, uh, the, the Novartis uh, trials as well as, as well as the Juno studies have seen higher rates of neurotoxicity in BALL. We have, uh, as a center, been part of the Zuma-1 trial that's being reported as a late breaker on, on Tuesday uh, in, 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 in refractory aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Again, like the JCAR-017 uh, data that you were talking about, it's a CD19 uh, CAR. Um, we certainly saw uh, significant uh, you know, fractions of patients with cytokine release syndromes as well as neurotoxicities, but the rate of, of deaths uh, in the study was, was 3%. Uh, two, uh, two out of the three deaths uh, were thought to be associated with the product and, and again, related to either uh, cytokine release syndromes or, or, or especially neurotoxicity. Um, but you know, overall, there was uh, over 75% uh, uh, response rate uh, to CAR T cells uh, in a very highly refractory group of patients historically. 50% uh, of those patients ha had CRs. Uh, and at three months, it is notable uh, that, that there are uh, you know, roughly 40%, 39% of those patients are still uh, in remission at three months. 
Now, there are you know, mixed things. I think that, uh, you know, that if you look at Jim Kokender for studies at the NCI that, that I think led to uh, you know, the, the IP that, that uh, were uh, formed at, uh, at Kite, the initial uh, response rates to the three-month response rate that there was a little, there were, the initial response rates were actually a little bit lower, but the three-month response rates were more similar to what they saw initially. The interesting thing is in, in the initial uh, Kite, uh, I'm sorry, in the initial NCI experience, uh, patients who had a CR at three months typically maintained that CR, that those CRs were durable. But that is not something that we're used to seeing even in the allogeneic transplant setting. We're used to seeing a fall off and we certainly don't right. see plateaus of relapse curves at three months. So I think that, that although these data are, I think are very, very exciting, they're, 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 you expect that the CR rates uh, and the overall response rates might be five to six times what you might expect with other you know, historical therapies in this setting, uh, I think that the durability of these uh, therapies, uh, you know, still needs to be observed. We really have three-month follow-up. We'll see six-month follow-up soon. Uh, but I think, you know, I, I do think that from a regulatory standpoint, we're likely to see approval on the basis of what we've seen in 2017, but there's a, a lot to uh, learn.